Greetings, <laughs> spiritual warriors. Welcome again to our spiritual warriorship. Uh, we're presenting, as we say each week, spiritual warrior seminars from His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami's spiritual warrior books. He does have six spiritual warrior books. We are working from Spiritual Warrior 3, Solace for the Heart in Difficult Times. We're working, coming with Chapter 7 of that book, entitled 12 Qualities of a Spiritual Warrior. And that's what we've been going through over the weeks. And tonight we'll be doing <clears throat> 9 and possibly 10. I again remind you that the books can be purchased, Spiritual Warrior books can be purchased at um, Krishna.com store. And there's also, I understand, a link that you can get your free Spiritual Warrior poster with the qualities you can meditate on and study. And a beautiful picture um, from Hawaii. So. We like to remind you of what Bhakti Tirtha Swami says about his spiritual warrior books. He says these series of spiritual warrior books are to help us realize that we are on a battleground. And for those who are trying to propagate righteousness, justice, peace, and love, you're constantly at battle with illusion and sin and exploitation. He also reminds us the path of the spiritual warrior is not an easy path. It demands courage, determination, discipline, intense compassion, and unconditional love. Now you say, oh my gosh, I'd like to be one, but how do I do this? Well, we really are, basically, we're all spiritual warriors because he reminds us that we are divine beings, eternal beings. But he says that it requires an understanding that this world is not the final chapter and that we are on a mission. So, after hearing that, do you want to join the ranks? of this transcendental army, spiritual warriorship. You see, I'm wearing my badge to remind me um, because it is a difficult age we're going through in time. But he reminds us also that if one declares himself or herself engaged in higher consciousness, you have much to deal with. And I'm sure you're finding that out as you are moving along on your spiritual path and endeavoring to become more conscious, God conscious. So it's necessary to have technologies and methods to be victorious. We must fortify ourselves with spiritual knowledge and put that knowledge into practice. Okay, into practice, very important. Then, as a spiritual warrior, we are capable of helping others on this battlefield. So, we have been given, over the past few weeks, 12 qualities. You can call, he calls these tools. They can be also called technologies. I don't know uh, how many of you are returning or have been here a while. But I hope you're using them, or I, I want to put that in the question. Are you using them? And have you noticed any change? Okay, and I have been giving questions sometimes, and I hope that has helped. So what I want to do is to just review quickly. Well, let's review what the qualities we've been through, and then we'll get ready for the next quality. And interestingly enough, I found a bookmark, Spiritual Warrior Checklist bookmark that has the 12 qualities of a spiritual warrior. I can't offer to send you all 
any, but maybe we'll find a way again to put it on and make a link. I'm not sure. But let's go through them. And don't forget, you can get the book, Spiritual Warrior 3, Soulless for the Heart in Difficult Times at Krishna.com store. And if you have one on the shelf, I hope you pulled it out so we'll work through these together. Now, the first quality we talked on was sense control and mastery of the mind. An uncontrolled mind will be one's greatest enemy and a slave of the senses. Regulating the senses and focusing the intellect stops the mind's sabotaging effects and makes it a great friend and a door to the soul. And we spent quite a bit of time on the mastery of the mind and regulation. I hope you've been able to follow it. The next was humility. Recognizing God as the controller and being dependent on him. Never overreacting to fame, success, or position. And while dealing with the many, never overlooking the one. Fearlessness. Confidence comes from continuously validating conclusions through a threefold check and balance system of spiritual mentors, saints, and holy scriptures. That, that quality I had to go back and review because I'll share with you what was happening to me. Now, I've been doing these, um, what do you call them, broadcasts, videocasts, for a couple of weeks. And I read ahead and I try to feel how it's going to come through or if there's something to say or... But somehow, when I looked at the quality for this week, which is firm faith, and maybe we'll get to the next, which is perseverance, for some reason, I found myself in anxiety. And I couldn't understand why. I'd go back and I'd read. And when I get to reading that one, I'll go, maybe, I'll just tell you what went on with me to get to this point in this moment uh, at this time. Remember in Idle, uh, uh, what was it, No Idle Time, he talked about each moment, how we're to learn from it and grow from it and how important each moment is. So I went through some moments of, I don't know, uh, anxiety, I use that word. And I kept saying, what's the problem? And I'd look through it again and I'm saying, well, maybe I need to say something on this or what does this mean to me and how can I share with others? And what I found, usually when I get in that state, somehow it's like His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami who said he would be with us after, out of his body more than he was in his body. I got this sense of don't be anxious, just read what's there and those that can hear and understand will hear. And that kind of calmed me down, but I kept going back and forth. So what did I do? I said, well, since I'm talking spiritual, let me go back and check on being fearless, because it's a big one. The third tool is fearlessness. A spiritual warrior is naturally fearless. What need is there to shuffle our feet when we are backed up by a superior power? How can we be intimidated when our actual origin is divine? When we realize these things, there's no reason to hold on to various crutches because there are no cause for insecurity. So I read that and I'm saying that makes sense, but why am I feeling 
insecure at this before I even get on the air. It was quite amazing. But also in this um, quality, when he speaks of the check and balance system in our spiritual path um, of spiritual mentors, saints, and holy scriptures. And believe me, it's true and it works. What I did between yesterday and today, I, I have the database, I'm thankful for that, but I also have a lot of books. I just went in and I put uh, two of the words in the search that somehow I seem to be concerned about, do I have to explain it, do I understand it? And of course what came up was different selections of scriptures and Srila Prabhupada speaking at lectures and classes. And also, and we've read in here one of them, to have association of devotees. So I was starting to get calm with the Sastras, as it says, and hearing Srila Prabhupada and knowing that my guru was also, I know, available. But then I spoke to a devotee who I explain, and it's wonderful, I guess maybe that's a little bit of humility of sharing with a devotee that I was anxious, a little bit nervous about going on tonight. And that was, it is, it is a little bit of humility I'm working on because we all have the tendency we want to feel like I know what to do, I know what to say, you know. And for me, even as I'm older, sometimes I feel like, how can I let somebody know that I don't know? But in in the huge studying these qualities, and he reminds us in humility, one of the things is to know that you don't know. <laughs> humility means knowing there is so much we do not know. So with that thought in mind, I expressed myself to this devotee and it was so beautiful she ran through some her thoughts about this particular verse and it was instant. once she finished I felt calmer and I started getting ready so there's my confession for tonight <laughs> on endeavoring to follow apply these qualities in my life and hopefully you all are doing the same so where did we leave off I'm doing a review, right? Four is truthfulness. Always ready to speak truth in a way that will elevate whoever hears it. Five, compassion and pridelessness. One is determined to find joy in doing whatever is necessary to genuinely benefit others. Ready to go the extra mile to assist. Six, material exhaustion and disinterest in material rewards. Having disgust with mundane culture and achievements. Seven, no idle time. Always extremely accountable to God and to those one serves. Knowing time belongs to him and not oneself. Eight, patience and selflessness. Desperate to attain the goals while depending on the Lord's mercy. All right, so are you now ready for nine? And nine is firm faith. The ninth tool is having firm faith. Faith is necessary in everything. It is not a master, oh, I'm sorry, it is not a matter of being Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Muslim, or Buddhist. 
it is a matter of how much we are following the laws of God and how much faith we have in God's potency. Then he goes on. There's a story about a Brahmin, a Vedic priest, a cobbler, and a mystic sage. The mystic sage had the ability to come and go between the higher kingdoms and actually visit with the Lord. One day, the sage was making a trip to visit the Lord. So, the Brahmin and the cobbler both requested that the sage ask the Lord how long it would take for them to join him. When the sage met with the Lord, he asked, how long would it be before the Brahmin and Kabbalah could join him? The Lord said, the Brahmin who is doing all the rituals, austerities, and reading all the scriptures will live many lifetimes before he will join me. But the simple cobbler will come to me in his next life. The sage was surprised by the Lord's answer and asked for further explanation. The Lord said, when they ask you what I was doing, tell them, I was threading an elephant through the eye of a needle. You will understand my answer when you hear their replies. When the sage returned, he met with the Brahmin and told him, the Lord said he will live many lifetimes before joining the Lord. The Brahmin was shocked and said, that's nonsense. I have done everything ethical and moral that I need to do. And everyone knows it. Any humility there? <laughs> the Brahmin began to wonder if the sage really did visit the Lord. So he asked the sage what the Lord was doing. The sage told him the Lord was threading an elephant through the eye of a needle. The Brahmin laughed <laughs> and said, the sage had not really seen the Lord. Then the sage met with the cobbler and told him the Lord said he would go to him in his next life. The cobbler gratefully accepted this answer and asked, What was my Lord doing? The sage gave him the same answer as well. The sage was puzzled. No, what? Oh, the cobbler gratefully accepted the answer. as well. And the sage was puzzled, so he asked the cobbler if he truly believed that the Lord was threading an elephant through the eye of a needle. The cobbler answered, if my Lord can take a tiny seed 
and make fruits, vegetables, and huge trees grow from it, then what difficulty is there for him to do other unusual things? The cobbler's faith was not based on rituals, externals, or what he thought he was, or what he thought the Lord owed him. The cobbler's faith was based on how he saw the Lord's hand in everything, from the simplest things to the most complicated. The sage realized the cobbler had deep faith and a truly spiritual consciousness. We need to purify our consciousness so that we can develop that deep faith. And that, that is the uh, story and comment for this. So let's see what Srila Prabhupada has to say. I found a few quotes from him and then something from the Sastras. One comment I found, the conditioned living entity can purify his existence simply by having firm faith in the transcendental glories of the personality of Godhead. I'm, I'm hoping or want, wondering, hoping that those who are hearing this, if, if it's helping you to think about your faith, I remember um, I was taking a class quite some time ago on one of the um, Jilla Prabhupada's books, I'm trying to remember. It was a small book. But anyway, the instructor, we got on the subject of faith. And um, what I recall is during the discussion, I realized that my mother had instilled a lot of faith in me that lasted me through most of my life. She had a she had a um, expression, um, and I hear it now, and I think it's even may have come from the scriptures. God doesn't give you more than you can bear. And of course, I get little flashbacks with that. And as he says, here's simple things. One, I remember when I was growing up, winters were cold and summers were hot. <laughs> the earth changes hadn't taken effect during that time. And when it was cold and living in New York City and having to go, I remember, to school, where I had to wait for high school, high school, because junior high, elementary school, I crossed the street. Not too bad when it's very cold. Junior high school, I had to walk about four, four blocks down before I got there, and I bundled up real warm. I think I wasn't too bad. But going to high school, I had to walk some blocks, wait for a bus to go cross town to get, and that's when it was cold waiting for that bus. And it was like, I can't take this cold. I got I don't want to even want to go out to school. And my mother would say, God doesn't give you more than you can bear. And it seemed like the day or that she would say that, the temperature would start going up and it wasn't that cold. And you know, you may say, What's the big deal? I mean, of course if you live here in Florida, what's the big deal? But each time in the summertime, now of course folks have air conditioners now. There was no air conditioner. I, I, I don't even remember if we had a fan. That was a long time ago, guys. And I would lay with my pillow on the windowsill hoping for a breeze to come. <laughs> and I mean, we would have like almost a week of about 100 degrees. And yet, she kept saying, God doesn't give us more than you can bear. And I remember other things, but somehow 
some things stick in your mind and help you manage and function. So there was always some faith there that God would take care. And we, I grew up during Depression time and hard times. What was that, World War II? We had ration books. Um, um, I think you got, I don't know, a pound of butter every two weeks or something. You had a coupon you had to go. It was just <laughs> wasn't that easy. And yet, somehow, I noticed in my home, we managed, and my mother was never grumpy or anything. It was always praying and calling on God. So I, I bring that up because this firm faith lets, reminds me of what was instilled in me and also made me realize how sometimes we drift away from it. But I pray I'm coming back to it now. And what I'm learning is it means, as this next statement Prabhupada says, Faith means complete conviction, not that it may be, no. Vishvasha means faith. How? What kind of faith? Firm faith without any doubt. Firm faith without any doubt. I want to go to the Sastras now. Srimad Bhagavatam 11.3.26 The translation. One should have firm faith that he will achieve all success in life by following those scriptures that describes the glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. At the same time, one should avoid blaspheming other scriptures. One should rigidly control his mind, speech, and bodily activities. Always speak the truth and bring the mind and senses under full control. How many qualities did you hear mentioned in this one translation? So what we're getting from Bhakti Tirtha Swami, we're getting the sastras. We're getting, as I told you, what was it, one of these... Um, when I went to Bhagavad Gita and I read the qualities uh, Krishna was presenting there and it was qualities that we have here uh, to be strong spiritual warriors. The idea is the spiritual aspect we must look at. We're spiritual warriors. We're on a battlefield, but we're gaining knowledge by hearing. Hearing is so important. And so right in this one translation at least three or four of the spiritual qualities we're talking about are mentioned. I hope you got it. You heard it. Purport by His Divine Grace, Shri Prabhupada. The definition of Shraddha or faith is given as follows in Chaitanya Chanamrita Madhya 2262. By rendering transcendental loving service to Krishna, one automatically performs all subsidiary activities. This confident, firm faith, favorable to the discharge of devotional service, is called Shraddha. Thus, a devotee should be confident that by carrying out the injunctions of Bhagavad Sastra or Vedic literature that directly rather than indirectly describes devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
one will easily achieve all knowledge and perfection of life. According to Sri Vishvanatha Chakravati Thakur, strict control of the mind, that was our first quality. See how important that is. Speech and bodily activities means one should rigidly abandon all sinful activities of his mind, speech, and body. And from teachings of Lord Kapila, increasing one's love for God is a gradual process. The first ingredient is faith. Without faith, there's no question of progress in Krishna consciousness, God consciousness. That faith is created from reading Bhagavad Gita carefully and actually understanding it as it is. I believe I mentioned at some point, if you do not have a Bhagavad Gita, Please, Krishna.com, you can read online where they have ebook, I believe, and you can order it for yourself or their lectures on it. Just hear. Hearing is so important to acquire these qualities, not even acquire, to awaken these qualities because they're all there within us. Why are they within us? Because they're qualities the Lord Himself says are Him. And we are, as we've been told by Bhakti Tirtha Swami in this, that we are eternal beings, that we're spirit souls, that God is the controller, we're his part and parcel. So that means they're there. And we're just being given an opportunity to awaken them and apply them in our lives. And or as we apply and awaken, the love that's also for God is within us, and that becomes awakened. And from that love, we can then give it to others and help others to um, find solace, as this book is called, Solace for the Heart in Difficult Times. So hearing is important. This is saying, again, increasing one's love for God. It's a gradual process. First ingredient is faith. Without faith, there's no question of progress in Krishna consciousness, God consciousness. That faith is created after reading Bhagavad Gita carefully and actually understanding it as it is. Unless one reads Bhagavad Gita, there's no question of faith in Krishna. One must have faith in the words of Krishna, particularly when Krishna says, abandon all dharmas, religion, and surrender to me. I will give you all protection. And I know in the Bhagavad Gita it says what Matsucha, do not worry. I had to deal with that myself yesterday and this morning. Why was I worried about coming before you this evening? So I had to look at myself and as I said, look at these qualities that I'm endeavoring to present and offer to you. How am I imbibing it and how am I living it? And what I found by doing my reading, more reading, because I've been reading all week, it just seemed to find me when I hear it by reading, I realize that I am being given protection and there's really nothing to fear. And it goes on, if we study Bhagavad Gita as a literary tri tri treatise, then throw it away. That is not faith. 
We must read it, absorb it, apply it, practice it, and live it in our daily lives. I found this in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, 39. Translation. A faithful man is dedicated to transcendental knowledge and who subdues his senses is eligible to achieve such knowledge. And having achieved it, he quickly attains the supreme spiritual peace. Purport by such knowledge in Krishna consciousness can be achieved by a faithful person who believes firmly in Krishna God one is called a faithful man who thinks that simply by acting in Krishna consciousness, he can attain the highest perfection. This faith is attained by the discharge of devotional service and by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, which cleanses the heart of all material dirt. Over and above this, one should control the senses. We're back to that first quality. I hope we're absorbing and understanding the importance. It comes up in the Sastras, it comes up in Srila Prabhupada's purports and throughout scriptures, any scripture will tell you about controlling the senses. A person who is faithful to Krishna and who controls the senses can easily attain perfection in the knowledge of Krishna consciousness without delay without delay. So it goes back to our patience and impatience, right? Remember? When we have an impatient desire to be God conscious, we will remember that there is no time to be inattentive or apathetic. So every moment counts. It, it's so wonderful. I'm realizing more and more as I'm going through these. There is a flow through these qualities. There's always a, a remembrance of God and our connectedness to God. And yet, they're practical for our everyday life. So uh, what I'm going to do now. Any, any questions? Just ask for questions. No. We're going to go to the next, 9, 10. We're going to do 10. Tenth quality, which is perseverance. Okay? The tenth tool is perseverance. A true warrior never wants the war to end. What you talking about? Listen. A true warrior is relentless and always ready to continue. We must be prepared to continually evaluate ourselves, regroup, and adopt strategies to help us move beyond what they seem to be defeat. You know, in the old time movies, I don't want to say old time movies, I don't go to the movies much these days, but I, in a battle, if any 
soldier turns around to go back, what's he called? You know, they beat him up, I guess. But you just don't do that if you're on the battlefield. The whole idea of you've got to keep going no matter what. That's the hero uh, stories and movies we get of the warrior who went on beyond. He went and he pulled his buddy back and he kept going. So as spiritual warriors, it's very important. We must be prepared to continually evaluate ourselves. We, as we remember back in um, the first quality, I believe, in Mastery of the Mind, he told us there that we have to look at ourselves. We have to find, we need to look inside ourselves. We need to perform self-examination to see where we are weak. Because the areas where we are weak and where we will be most tested, the, the area where we are weak are where we will be tested the most. Okay, so this is important. It isn't about pointing out there your fault, your fault, my dude, you did it, you said it, it did it. Or you didn't give me the right weapon. We have to see self examination, what's going on. So he goes on. The true test for warriors is how they act when wounded. The real spiritual warrior bounce, bounces back immediately in the face of defeat. Mm. Can hurt pretty bad sometimes. How do we bounce back immediately? Immediately, he said. Rather than caving in, the warrior learns from the encounter imbibes it, owns it, and becomes stronger from the experience. Again, if we're taking the time to examine ourselves, we will see where our weaknesses are, we'll see where our strengths are, and we'll realize that pointing the finger is not the answer, not pointing it out. We're pointing it in. And once we see what our strengths are, we know that we can move ahead. If we're getting the knowledge, remember one of the things for spiritual warrior is getting that spiritual knowledge, applying it so that we can use it on the battlefield. He goes on. There will always be temporary setbacks in spiritual life. But the real test is how we continue to move ahead. Even though spiritual warfare is seldom an easy path, the joy and love that we receive, serve as the spiritual warrior's rations. Huh. I haven't heard that word in a while. Rations. Remember that word? Any of you out there? What was that? Um, rations. Rations. What the soldier gets. Um, um, yeah, what the soldier gets. Isn't that all kinds of things? My mind's going back to World War II and the USO, what's it, USO, where you go, the soldiers come in, World War II, they come in and um, you serve them and, you know, have they dance and try to make them feel comfortable before they went back out. But the love and joy of being a spiritual warrior and staying on the path and on that battlefield, he says, it's seldom an easy path, but the joy and love that we receive serves as a spiritual warrior rations, which is feed, nourishment, nourishment. That's the word I'm looking for. 
further our joy and love. Create positive energy that brings more joy and love. And the cycle will continue and intensify as we persevere. There is joy in spiritual combat because it creates a tremendous vibration of purification. We have to remember that our spiritual activities are not confined within our consciousness, our family, or our immediate environment. Spiritual energy has an extremely powerful way of permeating and affecting the environment. People are uplifted and rejuvenated by the positive energy of a spiritual warrior's association. And I think we, we know that and we can all speak on that, that if you walk into a space or an environment or whatever, if you run into someone or meet someone and they seem fairly pleasant, or there's a nice exchange. But if you come in and you're high, you know, and somebody, the face is all turned down, and what what you looking at? You know? What's funny today? What makes you feel so good? Um... It's, it's difficult to interact in that kind of environment. But don't forget, now, spiritual warriors are on a battlefield, and we're to carry this love and joy within us so we can help others who are suffering. We can give them the knowledge that we are gaining, or have gained, that have made us such determined and persevering um, persons. So spiritual energy, spiritual energy has an extremely powerful way of permeating and affecting the environment. People are uplifted and rejuvenated by the positive energy of a spiritual warrior's association. We must endeavor to keep moving forward and not be detained and constantly renew our commitment to serving the Lord on the battlefield of consciousness raising and here again is reminding us what our purpose our mission our service our position is to serve the Lord whatever we're doing and he's mentioned it in these other um, I forget which one it is of pleasing the Lord whatever your action, your words, your deeds, it's to please the Lord. And as you please him, he reciprocates and that love and joy um, comes up. I found a few, something from the Sastras on perseverance. This is from Bhagavad Gita 634. One should engage oneself in the practice of yoga, bhakti yoga, with determination and faith and not be deviated from the path. One should abandon without exception all material desires born of mental speculation and thus control all the senses on all sides of the mind. There's that control the senses again. It comes up time and again, and that was our first quality that we studied. The purport. The yoga practitioner should be determined and should patiently prosecute the practice without deviation. Remember we went through Patience and impatience. What was that under? Yes. Patience and impatience. Sometimes we have to be patient and not give up 
if it seems like it's difficult, but we keep going patiently. One should be sure of success at the end and pursue this course with great perseverance, not becoming discouraged if there is any delay in attainment of success. Success is sure for the rigid practitioner. And regarding this bhakti yoga, which is what? Bhakti yoga is linking back with God through loving devotional service, pleasing the Lord. And you, how are you going to please the Lord? You have to please each other. And that's what the spiritual warrior's mission is. Rupa Goswami says, One can execute the process of bhakti yoga successfully with full-hearted enthusiasm, perseverance, and determination. Full-hearted enthusiasm. Are you enthusiastic about your life and what's going on now? Are you enthusiastic about hearing these qualities and endeavoring to imbibe them? You have them, and they're probably, you know, just being brought up Lord, right in your face now. But are you enthusiastic about it? How, how important it is in your everyday life and as you, with your family and your friends to move ahead on this battlefield at this stage uh, of all the things that are going on. So I like this. One can execute the process of bhakti yoga successfully with full-hearted enthusiasm, perseverance, and determination by following the prescribed duty in the association of devotees and by engaging completely in the activities of goodness. As for determination, one should follow the example of the sparrow who lost her eggs in the wave of the ocean. How many of you know that story? You know, I keep saying, see the hands go up? <laughs> It's a wonderful story of determination. I remember I used to use it as an example quite a few times. And for those who don't, we'll go through it quickly. But a sparrow laid her eggs on the shore of the ocean. But what happened? That big ocean came and sweeped those eggs away. The sparrow became very, very upset and asked the ocean, please, please return my eggs. But the ocean did not consider her appeal. So what happened? The sparrow decided to dry up the ocean by herself. And she was going to pick out the water with her small beak. You know the size of a sparrow and beak, but just when she wanted her eggs back. And what happened? Everyone laughed at her and said it was impossible. But she was determined and she kept, she started. So the news of her activity reached Garuda. Um, um, he's the giant bird who carries Lord Vishnu. And when he heard it, he became compassionate. There's that, remember, one of the qualities is compassion. He became compassionate towards the small, his sister bird. And so he came to the sparrow, came to see the sparrow. And he was quite pleased with her determination. And this is how when we are in some difficulty, but we don't deviate and we don't back off and we make the effort, the Lord is pleased with our effort and he sends help. Wonderful example that you're not in it alone as a spiritual warrior, you're not in it as you are determined and you keep going to grow and to help others to grow. So when Garuda saw the bird and he was pleased, he said he would help her. So what did he do? Well, he turned to the ocean and he asked the ocean, you return those eggs or else I'll <laughs> take care of it. I'll take up the work that she's doing. Well, the ocean got frightened and said, <laughs> uh, 
And what did it do? It returned her eggs. So see, sometimes the bully thinks they got you going. But when you know you're backed up by God, when you have that firm faith in God and you have that determination, my father used to say, you look him in the eye and that bully goes away. And these are examples that how you can keep fight on going. So the ocean returned the eggs and the sparrow was happy and that was by the grace of Garuda through the grace of the Lord. So it goes on, the practice of yoga, especially bhakti yoga and Krishna consciousness, may appear to be a very difficult job. But if anyone follows the principles with great determination, the Lord will surely help, for God helps those who help themselves. And as Bhakti Tirta Swami told us as we began, I like he uses the word vigilant application of spiritual warfare may prove to be our very lifetime. Vigilant application. So I'm going to stop there, I, I think. Any questions? No questions. Everybody's out. Okay, but um, what I want to say also is that next Thursday is uh, holiday the 25th, and the following Thursday is also New Year's, and everybody will be making wonderful resolutions for um, becoming more God conscious. Uh, so I won't be online, but it'll give you an opportunity and me to study and meditate on these qualities and um, endeavor to apply them to our lives. Um, should I, I have two more, I could, shall I keep reading or, yeah, okay. So let's move on. 10, 11. Okay, the 11th is curiosity and enthusiasm to learn and grow. And hopefully we're all doing that as we move through these qualities. The 11th tool is being curious and having enthusiasm about learning and growth. We must start each day curious about what tests we will encounter, what lessons we will learn, what lives we will connect with, we must take each day as a fresh new experience and another chance to serve the Lord better. I, I, this is appealing to me. Um, I have a way when uh, I don't, well each day, I'm so thankful to get up <laughs> out of bed each day and be able to get myself bathe and dress and pick up my beads and possibly get to the temple and I'm so thankful I was able to get there four days this week um, and truly I have learned through my experience that each moment is sort of an adventure especially when it's not going my way and my 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 my, my expression has been okay Krishna what do you want me to learn from this? What's going on? You know, because I do see him as a very dear friend. So Bhakti Tirta Swami continues, We cannot think that we will automatically be successful today simply because we were successful last week. Thinking this way, will cause us to drop our guard and go into battle without weapons. That's dangerous, right? Our previous victories will not carry us through our present obstacles. God does not forget our service. But our enemies do not forget us either. 
If we leave ourselves open for attack, we will surely be ambushed. The easiest way to become vulnerable is to gloat over our former successes. And this works anywhere, even in the office, if you've got an office job or some administrative. You can't live on your past successes. The, the CEO or the boss, they're looking for new ideas and new expressions to move the company ahead, to move that department ahead. So this is it, it, across the board. The easiest way to become vulnerable is to gloat over our former successes. Of course, now if you've been working on which one of those qualities... Humility, which is powerful, you wouldn't, you won't be in that position. We must remember that sin is constantly increasing in intensity. Breaking out of the material prison requires constant dedication in devotional service. If we're still using yesterday's weapons, yesterday's realizations, yesterday's techniques, yesterday's considerations, we will become today's casualty. And those of you trying to keep up or who are keeping up with the new technologies, you see that they're not sitting still. Every day there's a new W-E-Y-E or P-Pod or D-Pod. I, I just see it because I'm just still <laughs> dealing with the computer and a cell phone. But it's movement out there. So what about those of us on the battlefield of the, the, the spiritual warriors who are dealing with consciousness and there's so many different levels of consciousness. So we can't get stagnant. We can't think Oh, I did pretty good last week. I got somebody to chant the mantra or, oh, yeah, I talked to somebody about God. You've got to be constantly learning and growing. He says we must take each day as another chance to serve the Lord better and accelerate our growth. Make a game of your challenges and compete against yourself to surpass yesterday's performance. And that takes me back. It's so amazing to just see how they, they just weave through in that, um, he says, in no idle time, that particular quality. And I, I read this to quite, I shared this with quite a number of people after I, I, I shared this with you. Every moment is a chance to be an example of divinity. Every moment is a chance to learn a new lesson or further develop an old lesson. Every moment has a purpose and a spiritual warrior will make each moment work for the Supreme Lord who has so mercifully given us these moments to move closer and closer to him. Now that was quality, no idle time. So you see if you're studying these and imbibing these and endeavoring to, to, to bring practice it in your everyday life, as you move to the next, you see how it's just fitting right in. It's not like, oh, what does he mean by that? No, it's like, that's right, because I've been working with that one, practicing that, living that, and this falls into place. So he says, we must take each day as another chance to serve the Lord better and accelerate our growth. Make a game of your challenges and compete against yourself to surpass yesterday's 
performance. And again, with that one, if you are endeavoring with your faith and pers understand this perseverance, that would be an easier step for you, this quality. So, I'm going to go to the final and twelfth quality, since we have time. The twelfth tool is to surrender to divine will. All of the previous tools help to prepare the spiritual warrior for this very important step. For a spiritual warrior, surrender is actually a victory as long as we are surrendering to God. We see amazing results when we truly put God's will and mission before our own. We simply have to pay close attention to what God is telling and showing us. The Lord is active in our heart. We are simply blinded by the material coverings of this world and often we do not see the help he constantly offers us through his arrangements. Through his arrangements. Remember which quality was that when we're reminded that God is the controller. And as long as we remember that, we won't think that we're running the show. But he uses us through us. He gets what needs to be done. It's our June on the battlefield, right? You know, Krishna could have killed all those warriors, but he used him as the medium so that he could follow his instructions and fight. He had that duty. Spiritual warriors realize the Lord will guide them and they remain on the outlook for help and the lessons to be learned. Spiritual warriors realize the Lord will guide them and they remain on the lookout for help and the lessons to be learned. As we sincerely try to live a spiritual life and better ourselves, God will reciprocate tenfold. I know you've heard this. What is that? You take, what, one step and God takes a hundred? <laughs> but it's said, we, we make these comments and remarks, but they're really true and practical in our lives. Often, when we are trying to resolve a particular problem, or we are consumed with our difficulties, the Lord will arrange for us to meet someone who can help or will give us a hint of where the answer is. It's not a coincidence that we find the answer to the problem because we looked at some old notes listened to a lecture, or read a particular book. That is the Lord assisting us. The help is always there. But sometimes we put up walls that do not allow this guidance into our heart. And again, this goes back, I, if I recall, to the first quality of why we need to master the mind, because the mind will put up walls 
uh, and obstacles. And why is that? Because he says here, our conditioned minds hate change and have, and have a deep fear of being abandoned. That is why the mind does not want the soul to take over. And all these qualities we've been moving through is what we're doing. We're awakening the soul. We're getting closer to the Lord. We're remembering him. And we have to continue that so that that mind will not put up a wall. We knock the walls down. He continues. Other times we are wide open begging for help. When we are distraught and seeking, we become eager to receive the Lord's help. That is why many times the transcendental system will arrange for us to feel desperate and frustrated. Huh, how about that? God wants us to turn to him. God has so much to help us with. And all we have to do is just turn to him. He continues, Bhaktivedanta Swami. Sometimes the Lord arranges to make us sick, gives us this problem or that, or takes something away so we can become intensified in consciousness and open to receive the Lord's help. When we are frustrated, really frustrated, we think, help, Lord. Then our barriers go down and we see how the Lord has been offering us assistance all along. How many times did it take us to really reach a moment of great frustration or difficulty? Oh God, where are you? Hmm? It happens. We remember when it really, the going really gets tough. It continues. Living a spiritual life means living a natural life. Our natural state is to be surrendered to God's will. But we cannot surrender to God's will without developing the tools of the spiritual warrior. Working with these tools automatically puts us in a different consciousness. Simply reading about the tools puts us in a higher consciousness. We need to evaluate our relationship with God and constantly take inventory to see whether we are catering to our material self or if we're acting in accordance with our understanding of God's will for us. This is not easy to do. But spiritual warriors try their best and always look for ways to do better each day, each situation, each moment. And so, spiritual warriors, we've completed the 12 qualities presented to us by... His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami. I hope they've been helpful to you. I hope <laughs> you will continue growing. I hope you will imbibe them or have imbibed them. And it says here, if you work with these tools, you automatically get in a different consciousness. Simply reading and hearing, you're hearing now, about the tools 
puts us in a higher consciousness. So when he, the next thing he says, we need to evaluate our relationship with God and constantly take inventory to see whether we are catering to our material life or if we're acting in accordance with our understanding of God's will for us. And in evaluating our relationship, we'll know that we are his servants and our position and duty is to serve with love and devotion and he reciprocates in time. So I thank you for your attention. Um, we will come back together on January 8, 2009. Lord willing, I'm still around and you're there. And we may then go through the question and answers for this chapter and then we'll see what we'll continue to offer. Any comments, questions? Um, there's a comment. Comment. From Holly. Uh, hi, Holly. Um, Mother and Johnny, thank you so much for sharing with us. I'm so blessed to be here. I am very interested in learning more about Bhakti Yoga and of serving God. I have so much to learn. I am so excited to be learning to follow him in love instead of fear and to learn of his beautiful love. Thank you for your comment. Wonderful, wonderful. It sounds like you're hearing and imbibing. And I thank you and I don't know other comments or questions. All right. Harry Krishna, happy holiday. Blessings to you all. Harry Krishna.